some years ago, I was reading, I mean, I heard in the news, one of the other story of a man that was hiking in the mountains. He shouldn't have been by himself, but he was. They would sell us out the money system. And he fell and severely injured himself, and he knew he was so isolated in this ravine that no one could find him. So for six weeks, he lived on ants, moss, he lost 75 pounds, and finally was able to drag himself to safety. And when he got to safety, and of course he was interviewed by many, and he made the statement, he never lost hope. That's so important in life. In fact, hope is essential in every aspect of life. I think we know the story of Thomas Edison. Uh, he certainly was determined to have success in inventing a, a light bulb. Of course, he was having trouble with the filament. And he tried one material after another after another. He tried hundreds of materials. And one day he was asked, aren't you discouraged after all those failures? And he replied, no. Now I know hundreds of ways it won't work. <laughs> so even failure can go along with success because it can eliminate, but we don't have to do that again. And you move on to new opportunities. Successful individuals are those who tenaciously keep trying, even in the face of defeat. And that certainly applies to us in our Christian walk with the Lord. As we know God is leading us, there will be barriers and obstacles in our way, but I have learned as we keep moving forward in faith, in due time, God has a way of removing them. And you might remember when Israel was about to cross the Jordan River at flood stage, God did not open up that river right away. They had to walk right down to the bank and even put their feet in the water. And finally, it opened up. They did not stop or hesitate. They knew it was the will of God. One of my favorite statements along this line in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 500. Man can shape circumstances, but circumstances should not be allowed to shape man. Amen. We should seize upon circumstances as instruments by which to work. We are to master them, but they should not, we should not permit them to master us. Men of power, and of course, this was written back in the 1800s, early 1900s. We'd say men or women in power today are those who have been opposed, baffled, and thwarted by calling their energies into action. The obstacles they meet prove to them positive blessings. They gave self reliance. Conflict and perplexity call for the exercise of trust in God and for that firmness which develops power. You've heard me say many times that if God never gave us opportunity to trust Him, we would never learn to trust Him. And that is why He allows challenges to come our way. And this is why, in part, I chose our subject today in our scripture, Romans 8, 24. For we are saved by hope. Hope in every circumstance of life. That's what the Lord wants us to have. Of course, Satan wants to get us down. And one thing I have found, my wife and I just talked about that today, we all know at times when Satan attacks, you can feel it, you can see things going on. But one thing I've discovered in life, the more Satan attacks, he's seeing that something good is coming. Amen. And he's doing everything he can. You know, he sees behind the scene that you and I don't see. And he sees an angel of God marshalling and working. And he's been around long enough to know what certain movements mean. And when he sees that, he's going to try to get in the way, of course, in our life. And so, at the time, it can be a bit challenging, but it is good. Again, even when the weight comes on us, the challenges come, keep your eyes on the Lord. And remember, he is working something out that you may not know about now, but it's going to be a wonderful blessing. And when you look at the definition of hope, I came across this. Eager anticipation. Not just, oh, I'm kind of hoping. <laughs> Eager anticipation and expectation. 
And I find it interesting when Paul wrote also, our text is from Romans, where Paul wrote, but he also wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. He connected hope with two other things. He said, now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. So hope is closely associated with faith and love. How does that work? Well, it says the greatest, the greatest of these is love. When you know God loves you, it'll be easier for you to have faith in Him. Amen. And when you have faith in Him, it'll be easier for you to have hope Amen. that all is going to work out okay. And I know we've all been through things in life and we find that to be true. So I always encourage folks, pray to God and ask Him to remove from whatever's in your heart and mind that's keeping you from knowing God loves you. Because the most important thing you can know about God, above everything else, is that He loves you. That is number one of everything else. Because if you know that in your heart, and by the way, there's a difference between knowing that in the head and knowing that in the heart. When you look at Ephesians chapter 3, being in verse 16, if you ever have a chance, you might go through the writings of Paul and find out what he prayed for, for those who he was writing to. He'll tell you. And this is one of those cases where he told those at Ephesus what he was praying for them, for God to do in their life. And you notice there in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, he was praying that he, God, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. We need to pray every day for God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. That's the only way we will have the strength of Jesus Christ in us because, as he says next in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you be rooted ground in love. It is through the Baptist Holy Spirit that Christ most fully lives in us. And Paul, later on in Ephesians here, says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And the Greek verb form for be filled is continuous action. Keep on being filled. So that's why I tell folks, and I remind myself as well, when I woke up this morning, I thought, okay, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. We all need to ask God to do that every day. The moment you wake up, get into heaven of asking God to fill you with the Spirit. Because that's how Christ lives in us, most fully. That's what he said here. And then he talks about love. He's saying in verse 17, the last part, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend comprehend, understand, really know. With all the saints, he wanted those in Ephesus, and us as well, to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. What he's saying here, I'm praying for you folks in Ephesus, and of course, through God's word, that we would know, not just in our head, God's love. It would not simply be a head knowledge. For instance, somebody might say, does God love you? Yeah. How do you know he loves you? Well, Jesus came and died for me. Those are intellectual facts. And if that, now God understands that, he'll accept us for that. But if that is as far as our knowledge of God's love for us goes, it's not quite getting gotten down to the heart. And I've known that for myself. I think as guys in general tend to live a lot in the head, and not so much in the heart. Um, I think sometimes the ladies live in the heart a little more, which can be a blessing. And that's what we need each other, by the way. Don't let our heart get harder than our head. We want to be able to be receptive. And it's an important prayer. I know through the years, and I've had to pray this prayer, Lord, I do pray that you remove from me anything that's a barrier from knowing deep in my heart you love me. Because I knew in my own walk with the Lord, a lot of it was intellectual. But I will tell you this, God will hear that prayer. 
And He will work in our life and will start working in our heart to open our heart to understand. We do that through different experiences, whatever He chooses, to help us to know in our heart that He loves us, because that's what Paul was praying for. Verse 10, 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge more than the head but goes to the heart. Why? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The more we know God loves us, the more of Him we will experience. The more of the fullness of God we experience in our life. And of course, the more we know He loves us, the more faith we will have in Him, and the more hope we will have. And it, actually, a, an expectation of knowing that God is going to do wonderful things for us because He's promised. And so, hope and love are so closely related. And really, hope is so associated with everything in life. In a marriage relationship, if a couple is having challenges in, in their marriage, if one or the other loses hope, that the relationship can be resolved and improved, it's a very dangerous situation. Or in a wayward child, if one loses hope, that that child will ever return to God. And let me tell you, never lose hope. <laughs> Keep praying. Whether it's a relationship or a relation of marriage, whether it's a relationship of a wayward child, whatever it might be, or if someone's unemployed. It's a dangerous thing to lose hope that one would ever find good employment again. I always tell folks, if you lost your job, you didn't lose your provider. God is our provider. You never lose your provider. All you did was lose the means God was using to provide for you, and you had to come up with another one. But He may allow that to happen for us to learn to trust Him. And if we know He loves us, we would never doubt Him to lead us to another job. Like when, uh, when you had, if you had children in your home and they're little, did your son or daughter come to you every day and say, Mommy, are you going to feed me tomorrow? I think it was probably going to cross that. Uh, yeah. Of course I'm going to feed you. And what if they came to you tomorrow? Mommy, Daddy, are you going to feed you tomorrow? No. Why did they not say that? They knew we cared for them. They knew we loved them. We knew they, they knew there'd be a roof over their head, there'd be a bed, there'd be food on the table. That's what God wants us to be with Him. It's kind of second nature to trust Him. Have faith in Him. Have hope in Him. And not, that's why He said, saved by hope. But hope plays a very important role. Now, God's Word is very clear. He never wants us to put hope in the wrong thing. We can do it in the wrong thing if we're not careful. Many put their hope in man. Now there's a text in Psalm 146, 3 that says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. And I'm sure we've all experienced this. God will allow men to fail you if He sees we're putting our hope in men. They may fail you in, by saying something in words or in some actions. Now, Jesus will never fail you. The Lord, I know when I became a Christian in the Seventh-day Adventist, the first thing I was told is that the message is perfect, but the people aren't. See, we're not a, we're not, what do they call that? We're not a, whatever it is for saints. We're, you know, we're all sinners on our road to, to heaven. And we're called saints in God's word. Praise God. We're covered by his righteousness and we're forgiven. But, um, yeah. Man is going to let us down. Don't look to man. Because if we do, we can lose hope. And I've seen people, in fact, I would say the majority that leave the Seventh Adventist Church leave because they got hurt by some person. Something was said. Some behavior they saw. Well, Jesus will never say the wrong thing to you. Jesus will never behave in the wrong way towards you. And so that's an important lesson to learn. And the earlier we learn that in our walk with the Lord, the better. Because it will help us to stay with the Lord. Because verse 5 tells us in 146, he says, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, we also may be tempted to put our, our hope in material possessions, especially in 
to westernized countries, prosperity. Sometimes we can trust our bank account. Our Lord, sometimes God will let the bank account go down. We saw that happen back in what, 2008. A lot of people lost a lot of money. But again, you didn't lose your provider. I'm a little older now. Many of us here are a little older. We can worry about retirement. Don't worry about retirement. God's got a great retirement plan for you. And he, he will always come through for you. <laughs> I find, you know, there's so many scriptures uh, along this line. Um, the one in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 and 10. Those what Paul says, but those who desire to be rich. You know, in the Western world, the United States, you know, there's always that, you know, cap I'm not against capitalism, but, you know, you get caught up. More money, more material things. Those that desire to be rich go into temptation and the snare that too many foolish and harmful lusts which draw men into destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You sure see that in the world, they can't. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Be careful, get rich plants. Trust in the Lord for our provision, not in money. We can also look to worldly pleasures. You know, when you think about Moses, he was in the courts of Egypt. He had everything a person could want. He could have been aligned to be Pharaoh. But we're told in Hebrews 11.25, he chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, don't think sin's not pleasurable. If it weren't pleasurable, we'd have been tempted, right? But don't be tempted by the pleasures of sin for a season. We look at God's Word. Instead, we put God's Word first. And that's what, what uh, Moses did. You know, there's a text that's interesting along this line. When you look at the world today and all the pleasures that are out there, uh, you name it. There's so many enticements out there. In Proverbs 14, 12 and 13. There is a way that seems right to man. And there are so many out there following different ways that they think are the ways to happiness. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And the next verse is very interesting. Even in laughter, there's a lot out there in the world that go to the worldly activities. And yes, there may be laughter. A lot of different things going on. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. And how many stories in life we've seen that to be the case. The only true happiness will be found in the Lord. That's the only place where it's found. And John tells us this in 1 John 2, 15 and 7. He says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. He just lists them here. We need to have love for the Father. And that's why I say we need to go deep in our heart that God loves us. And, you know, there's a text in 1 John 4, 19 that says, we love God because he first loved us. What that text is really saying is that it's reciprocal. We love God because he loves us. He first loved us. What is that saying? I can only love God to the degree that I know He loves me. And so if I want to love God with my whole heart, I must know deep in my heart that He loves me. And that is so important for us living in this day and age. And that's so important for those living when Jesus comes. Because you heard me say it before. We know what in the last days the issues will be over God's law, obedience to God. You will not be willing to give up your life for a law. Because the law says you don't have to so far. You will not commit everything to that law. You will only commit yourself to a God who you know loves you. That is what will get you through. And the motive that will get you through to obey God in such times will be that you would rather die than hurt 
Jesus. Because you know he has done so much for you. And that's why those living in the last days, just before Jesus comes, and I can tell you this, all earthly support will be withdrawn. You know that from prophecy. It will appear from circumstances. There is no hope. But if you know God loves you, then you will have hope. Because you know He has been faithful to you in the past. That's how you got to know Him. Those through the challenges of life. You know He was faithful to you in the past. And He does not change. And you know He will be faithful to you now. That's the key. Now, we as Christians certainly have many reasons to be hopeful. I found it interesting. When I lived in the Northwest, in the home of Washington area, there's a facility called Western State Hospital. And there's some mental uh, patients there and some other issues. And I was talking to one of the counselors there one day, uh, was visiting somebody and happened to be talking to a counselor. And they made an interesting statement. They said guilt was a major underlying cause of many of the problems that the patients were having there. Now that's an interesting statement. As Christians, we should have no guilt. Why? Because we have asked God to forgive us for our sins. You know the scripture. Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. For your sins are like scarlet. They should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There is no reason for you or I to feel guilty, worthless, shame. No. Well, we know we have failed our Lord. Lord, forgive me. How many times do you have to ask God to forgive you? Once, for any particular sin. And if Satan tries to badger you with it, which he will, he tries to bring it back to your mind, throw the word of God back on him. If I confess my sins, he's faithful just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You see, if you ever doubt that you're not important, just look to the cross. You know, I, we're, my wife and I just talking some this morning. When you look at the whole universe, we've seen some pictures of the whole universe, but <laughs> this world is such a tiny speck in the universe. We're even a smaller speck <coughs> on that planet. And yet God, we are so valuable to Him that God put it all on the line for us that we can be with Him forever. Never doubt your value in God's eyes. You are of great value to God. And if you ever doubt it, look at the cross of what He's done for us. And also, God sees in us what we might become. You see, Satan wants us to look at what we are and where we failed and you know, never amount to anything. That's not God's way of looking at us. Think about those guys he chose to be disciples. Remember I said in the announcements, God loves to choose the least likely? I think if we were sitting on the committee to choose the 12 disciples, I don't know if we'd have chose those guys. But God did. And we know, take Peter. I picture Peter as kind of a, a bouncer type guy. You know. um, kind of a big guy, rough, boastful. All these made for safety. I won't. I'll never deny you, Lord. You know, very boastful. Loud. What did he do? He denied Christ three times. Even with cursing and swearing. But you know, when God called Peter, he saw what Peter could become through Jesus Christ. And you know the story of what he went through. And later on, after the resurrection, Jesus came to Peter and he said, Feed my lambs. You know, those little ones. <laughs> Feed my lambs. And he's, Peter became later tender and sensitive and became a great leader in the church. Took time, but God didn't give up on him. Neither will he give up on you. 
God sees in us when we may become. You think of James and John. Remember what Jesus called them? Sons of what? Thunder. They're in this city, and this city rejects Jesus, and they're walking around and say, Jesus, call down fire on them and burn them up. That's the kind of guys they were. Sons of thunder. <laughs> Later, ah, uh, John. He probably came to understand the love of God better than any of them. You're reading John, John's writings, the gospel and his letters. You, you see the love there. He's very gentle, very loving disciple. And James, when they had that meeting in Jerusalem, there was some contention about who's God's calling and what should be required of the new believers and everything. James went very loving to to deal with the very difficult situation that died in the church. Remember that. God is always looking at you and what you will become through Jesus Christ. He doesn't simply look at where we are now. You talk about having hope. God has a lot of hope in every one of us and He wants us to keep hope in Him. You know this text. There's infinite possibilities in all of us through God. I mean, infinite possibilities. Eternal consequences for good that can take place through every one of us. And I like that text in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts. You know this. This is God's thoughts toward us. Take this personal, folks. Here's what he's saying to you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's God's attitude toward us. And let me tell you, God did not call you to failure. No. You might, did God call you? Yes, He called you. You wouldn't be here today if God didn't call you. The devil doesn't want you here. God does. You respond to that call. He doesn't call us to failure. This is my favorite text. It's kind of the foundation of when I was first a uh, pastor. I was wrestling with my first evangelistic meetings. I'd just been out of seminary not even a year. And I'm in my little church in Ferndale, Washington, and I'm going to do evangelistic meetings. And I'm praying in my office, and the closer I came to the opening night, the more fearful I got. So I was, I was praying in the office one day, and then I was, Lord brought to my mind reading his word, and I came to John 15. And I was reading in John 15 when I came to this verse, John 6, 15, 16. It rang in my ears. And by the way, if you're reading the word and it just jumps out at you, that's called hearing the word. That means God is using that scripture to specifically speak to you at that moment. That's what hearing the word there is. That's what he did with this. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Isn't that good to know? God's the one that called you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. See, God called you to a fruitful life in Jesus Christ. A life that bears fruit for him in the life and in service. That, that's what he's called us to. And he says that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He's called us all to be prayer warriors. And as he hears our prayers, he will answer those prayers. Now, will our life be a bed of roses? No. As I said, we'll face challenges. I like uh, this scripture in, in 1 Peter 5, 6-11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care on him. How much of your care? All of it. But you know what we usually do? We cast it on in prayer, and then we get up and take it back. Don't do that. Cast all your care on him. For he cares for you. That's why you do it. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a run line, walks about seeking whom he may devour. But resist them steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Every one of us are facing challenges this morning. We're all going through different things. But the God of grace, who called us, he called you, unto eternal glory by Jesus Christ, 
After you've suffered a while. Oh, he'll not be suffering for a while. He's with you in it. But he'll make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You know the promise of God in Isaiah 8, 28. <laughs> for we know that. What's the next word? All. For we know that all things work together for good. Those who love God, those who are called, there's that calling again, according to his purpose. You may not understand how it's going to work out for good, but if you know that promise and believe it, you will not lose hope. Can't happen. I love the story of, of Joseph. You probably will hear me share it numerous times. I love it. He's about 16 years old. His brothers are jealous of him, and he's sold as a slave. You can imagine, he's on that Ishmael like caravan to Egypt. He's sold as a slave, and you know the story. In God's providence, he never lost hope. He never lost faith, even though what he was going through. It seemed very hopeless. He remained faithful to God, and he ended up being put right next to Pharaoh in power. Second most powerful man in the world at that time, right next to Pharaoh. And the family came and his brothers came. They thought he was dead and gone. They had no idea where Joseph was. And finally Joseph revealed himself to them. These words are so amazing. Genesis 45. Verse 5 and 7 and 8. Here's Joseph's words to his brothers. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. Because you sold me here. For God did send me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve posterity for you in the earth. And to save your life to the great deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here for God. What an amazing insight Joseph had. Yes, God will let bad things happen. That circumstances look terrible. But we can trust him. We're working out for our good. You worry about money? I don't know if you've got the temperaments. I'm phlegmatic. Phlegmatic's had a problem with faith, by the way. God's had me on my challenges. But you know, a favorite scripture of mine is, is in Matthew 6. You know that one. Jesus says here in verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Did you get it? I'm talking to me too. Do not worry about your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food, body more than raiment? Then he talks about the birds in the air. He said, God feeds them all. And then he says, Honor not you of more value than they. The next time you go out and walk and you see a bird flying, remind yourself. <laughs> You're more valuable than a bird. God takes care of the birds. He will take care of you. Then he talked about the clothing and the lilies of the field. And God says, if he clothes the flowers, every time you look at a flower, when you go for a walk, and there's a lot of them around, remind yourself, God clothes those. If he'll clothe them and provide their necessities, he will provide for us. Amen. No question about it. So Jesus says here, Therefore, and he said it a second time, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles say, what does that mean, Gentiles? That means the non-believers. You see, as Christians, we should not worry about those things. Because if we do, we're like our, the, the son or daughter saying, Mommy, are you going to feed me tomorrow? That's what we're like. How do you think that makes God feel? <laughs> How would you feel as a parent if your child asked you that every day? No. He wants us to trust Him. He says here, for your heavenly Father knows you need it. Is that true? Does your Father know what your needs are? Of course they are. Of course He does. He knows what we need. Here's the key. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek God first. Put Him first in your life. Then all these things should be added to you. You know what the devil says? If you put God first through your tithes and your offerings and your time and whatever, these things would be subtracted from you. See, he, he contradicts God. 
But God says, if you put Him first in your tithes and offerings and whatever, these things will be added to you. And I'll tell you this, it's more than an addition plan, it's a multiplication plan with God. That's what I've discovered. So He says, therefore, He says it again, I guess He knew we tended to worry. Do not worry about tomorrow. Isn't that great? You do not have to be concerned at all about tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Or next week, or next month, or next year. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again because I'm talking to myself. Do not look in too much detail about the future. Now, that doesn't mean we don't plan. We try to have savings. Yeah, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But don't try to figure it all out. Because if you do, more than likely, unless you're a millionaire, <laughs> you may be, praise God. But unless you're a millionaire, you're going to probably start worrying. Because you're going to say, well, let's see, my, my retirement will go this far, but I don't want to do it for that. No, God's with you. So that's what he says. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, worry things, and then sufficient for the day is you got enough today to be concerned about. Don't worry about the necessities of life. That's scripture. So, you know, in reality, Christians should be perpetual, habitual optimists. We really should be. We should have no reason to be concerned about anything. Because, here's another scripture, I'll close with this one, Psalm 42, 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Has your soul ever been cast down? Of course. So you can talk to yourself next time. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Then that's why you're feeling a little down today. You put your name there. Why are you disquieted in me? Why are you worrying, Dennis? You put your name. Why are you worrying? Why are you upset? Why are you concerned? Why are you feeling a little down today? What does he say next? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise Him. What does that mean? That means God is going to pull me out of this thing. God is going to work it all for my good. And I will have something amazing to praise Him for. That's why it says in all things give thanks. I love sharing the story. And I'll with this. A number of years ago, I received a letter from the IRS. Don't you love to get those little letters from the IRS? And I opened it up. And they said I owe thousands of dollars. But I knew I had, had a particular form I had signed and sent off to them over 30 years ago. And I said, I sent that form. They don't have it. And I didn't keep it either. <sighs> when I got that letter, by the way, and this was hard to do, I lifted that letter up. That's where I contacted I lifted that letter up. And I said, Lord, I thank you for this. That was hard to say. Lord, I thank you for this. And this is going to be another testimony of your faithfulness. Now, that was hard to say. And that was nothing but pure naked faith, let me tell you. Okay. That's, that's, what, that's what he wants us to do, by the way. I tried it. So I called, 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 called. Finally, someone said contact somewhere. It took me probably a couple months. And I kept pleading with him, telling him. And I finally, I wrote off a letter to a certain place. And I got a copy of that form that I had signed it 30 years ago. And it had been filed away in some file cabinet in the IRS somewhere. That's amazing with the government, right? I can see God back, way back in the early 70s say to his angels, you know, Dennis is going to need that. <laughs> he doesn't know it, and he wasn't smart enough to keep a copy of it. So I'm going to take care of it. Because he's my son. Thank you to know. You're his son. You're his daughter. And he said, don't let that get lost. And it didn't. And I got it when it was needed. That's the kind of God we serve. Praise God. So I chose the 522. My hope was built on nothing less. 522. Let's stand together as we can pray the
We thank you, Father, that you have called every one of us to be your sons and daughters. Amen. And we thank you that you are a faithful Father. And you will never fail us. And I know, Father, that every one of us in this sanctuary today are facing one challenge or another. That's life. And I know whatever you're allowing us to face, to face, you will work it out for our good and your glory, because that is what you promised. And Lord, sometimes we, like the Father, whose son was devil-possessed, may say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And I know, Lord, at times, faith can be a challenge for us. But I know you understand that too. And I pray by your Holy Spirit you continue to fill us each one and that you will truly give us the faith of Jesus in our heart. That whatever comes our way, we will know deep in our heart that you love us. And that we have no reason to doubt or fear because you will work out everything for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.